Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining members of the One Million Teachers of Color campaign for this webinar focused on innovations in policy and practice to retain teachers and school leaders of color. My name is Andy Smith, and, I, and I'm with TNTP, an organization working to ensure that we're partnering with and pushing PK through 12 system leaders to design and deliver on the classic American expectation that education can offer pathways to opportunity for every generation. Um, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. A few logistical notes before we get started. Today's webinar is being hosted in partnership with Latinos for Education and TNTP under the One Million Teachers of Color campaign banner. Today's webinar is the second webinar in a series of webinars that the One Million Teachers of Color campaign is launching, really aimed at amplifying best practice solutions and policies to advance educator diversity. Since uh, this is the second webinar in the series, we will provide a little brief background on the campaign before we get started. But for now, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Manny Cruz, gentleman from Massachusetts, from Latinos for Education, uh, the co-host organization for today's webinar for a brief introduction as well. Good to be with you, Andy. And thank you so much to our friends at TNTP, the steering committee members of the One Million Teachers of Color campaign, and all of today's attendees for being with us. My name is Manny Cruz, and I proudly serve as a senior policy fellow at Latinos for Education, where I've helped to lead our both our statewide policy work in Massachusetts and help launch our national coalition work with the One Million Teachers of Color campaign. Latinos for Education is proud to serve on the steering committee uh, for the One Million Teachers of Color campaign with dynamic organizations such as TNTP, the Center for Black Educator Development, the Hunt Institute, New Leaders, EdTrust, Teach Plus, and MCEL. Uh, Latinos for Education is a national nonprofit that places, develops essential Latino leadership in the field of education while also mobilizing Nuestra Comunidad to advance critical policies, to advance educational equity for our students, families, and community. At Latinos for Education, we're thrilled to be able to co-host today's One Million Teachers of Color national webinar aimed at the dissemination of best practices, shaping policy development, and a national narrative about why we need to diversify the educator workforce. And of course, to build a national coalition that can ensure that we reach the goal of One Million Teachers of Color, both recruited and retained, so that all of our students can have mirrors and windows in the classroom that reflect their identities. I know firsthand from my experience of building coalitions in the Commonwealth that bridging across cultures is essential. If we're ever gonna reach the goal of 1 million teachers of color, it will require all of us to be mobilized in our communities to ensure that we are advancing policies and practices that will shape the future of our nation for our children. So we're really excited about today's dynamic conversation uh, and our dynamic panel and looking forward to diving into a robust conversation. Andy, back to you. Hard to follow Manny every time. So the One Million Teachers of Color campaign has a bold goal and that's to increase the teacher and school leader corps by 1 million uh, teachers of color and 30,000 educators of color, I mean, teach school leaders of color over the next decade. Uh, the campaign is catalyzed by and based on the strong and growing research base that the broad impact of teachers and school leaders of color on all students is not just um, a nice to have, it's an essential strategy um, as we think about what the future of education looks like in this country. And when you put that in the context of a rapidly diversifying America, which is gonna depend on a thriving workforce, the research base makes it clear that increasing educator diversity, especially by retaining them, matters for the economic and social prosperity for all of us. But as clear as the research base is outlining the positive influence on, of educators of color, so is the data around the gap between educators of color and students of color. And the campaign came together because of this evidence. Campaign also recognized that to scale best practices and spark innovation in classrooms, districts, and states, it's important to create spaces to bring together stakeholders, just like yourselves, around educator diversity to share strategies and knowledge. So we're excited that you've joined us today and hope that you'll continue to do so in the months and years to come, as it's gonna take stakeholders in every district in every sector to reach our shared goal of closing the educator to student diversity gap. So let's turn now to today's discussion. The topic of educator retention, particularly for teachers and leaders of color, isn't a new one. For decades, studies have consistently shown that teachers and leaders matter for all students, and especially for students of color. Yet, the proportion of teachers of color in the workforce continues 
to lag far behind the share of students of color in our schools. But recruiting teachers of color only gets them into the building. We must also pay attention to their retention and sustain efforts to make lasting change in the diversity of the workforce. It's a smart school staffing strategy. It's the cost-effective HR policy. We're talking about funding clips right now. It's a smart and evidence-based school improvement strategy. And I'm so excited for you to hear from our panel who will explore this topic in depth through the specific frame of innovations in policy and practice to retain teachers and school leaders of color with a focus on scalable and replicable best practices. So I'm excited to introduce them now. Each panelist uh, will introduce themselves a bit more as they answer questions, uh, but today you'll hear from a phenomenal set of four folks. Um, we have Jean Desravines, um, who's the CEO of New Leaders, um, Amanda Fernandez, the CEO of Latinos for Education, Dr. Felton Moss, um, a senior professorial lecturer of education policy and leadership at American University and also an education fellow at the NAACP, and finally, Victoria Van Cleef, Executive Vice President of Learning Impact and Design at TNTP. Um, welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for, for joining the discussion today. Victoria, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, so it's hard to believe that 20 years ago, uh, yes, in 2003, TNTP published its first policy report um, that was called Missed Opportunities, How We Keep High Quality Teachers Out of Urban Classrooms. When you think about retaining teachers of color in 2023, what are the current missed opportunities? Um, and what strategies can state district and school leaders implement to retain teachers of color in the short, medium, and long term? Thanks, Andy. Hi, I'm Tori Van Cleef. Um, I actually started TNTP the year we published that report, and I worked both on some of the research and uh, the dissemination of that report. And I, you know, one of the things as I was thinking about today, what's hard is, I can name solutions that we called for in that report 20 years ago that we still haven't done at scale to address barriers both to attracting, but certainly to retaining the teachers we need for the students who need them most. So, you know, I'd say one current missed opportunity is that we talk a lot about solutions, but either we don't implement them, or we don't implement them as well as we hope, um, or we implement them in isolation, right? We're a field that loves a silver bullet single solution, and we keep applying isolated targeted solutions to really complex systemic problems. And so I think about, you know, one immediate lever for both states and districts to think about is um, we've been pushing and many states and districts have been pushing to diversify their workforce. And as Andy said, not just because it's the morally the right thing to do, but because there is a very strong research base saying this is an evidence-based practice. And it leads to better student outcomes. And so as systems have worked to staff up, teachers of color, we are about to have one of the smallest birth rate populations to roll through our schools and generations and an ESSER clip coming. Eliminate LIFO, right? Last in, first out policies, we have been calling that for that for 20 years. The, you will be terminating the, the, the teachers that you just worked so hard to attract. Um, and it's going to disproportionately affect teachers of color in this, in this next, in, you know, in, in what potentially could be coming as a financial cliff for school systems. Um, whether it's driven by smaller student population or financial constraints. And so that's something like, if you're a state, get rid of it. If you're a district, go to the, go negotiate it in collective bargaining. You can control that at a local level or a state level. Um, and those are the kinds of levers, like we kind of know these things. They've been around a long time. Some states have moved on it, not enough. Um, but that is the kind of thing that we could do right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of ideas like that. There's a lot of old ideas out there, team teaching, men, get mentors for people, pay lead teachers a stipend, move up salary increases earlier in the pay scale, shelter first year teachers. There's a lot of moves we could make to improve the retention of teachers of color and all teachers, frankly. But I think we know that like retaining teachers of color isn't going to happen by moving any single lever in isolation. You know, a focus on a career ladder or Gina's put people through brilliant leadership training, that alone is not going to do it. It's not going to change an outcome, right? Um, and so these systemic problems need systemic solutions. Um, and we need a systemic approach to attract, retain, and grow all teachers, but especially teachers of color. We, we've known for decades that that combination of you know, low pay, lack of career growth, a job description that borders on the impossible pushes talented people away from teaching. And we're not going to retain folks if we can't not only describe a more compelling vision of what we want for students, but one that really respects kind of the humanity and dignity, dignity of the educators in these systems. Um, and so I, you know, I think some of the things short term, especially 
whether it's in these polarized political times or in districts with, with predominantly white leaders and teachers of color, a lot of attention has to be paid to culture and working conditions to ensure that teachers of color are supported and not excluded. And I'm going to leave it to Jean, but like school leaders in particular need to be at the table invested in the value of a diverse staff um, and to understand that it that, that look, if you don't want to do it for moral reasons, here are the practical ones. Here's the research base as to why this is going to get you better outcomes for the kids that you need to serve. Um, and leaders, they've got to reflect on their own identity in this process, right? Building awareness of their identity, strengths, gaps, and how that might be having an, an impact. Those are, you know, those are things that we can all control, we can do, we're working on. How do we work on them collectively and in a more integrated way? And I think at TNTP, we've tried some of these things in, in practice, right? We've, we've seen the impact of programs that build spaces and places for educators of color to convene and create community. And we see exactly how important it is for retention of color of educators of color. Um, a few years ago, we created a, a cohort called our Black Educator Excellence Cohort. It supports aspiring Black teachers and overcoming systemic barriers, both to get into profession, but to be equipped to succeed and stay. Um, and since the program started, we've brought over 563 new Black teachers um, serving students in the classroom. That collective impact is going to be over 23,000 students a year are being touched and, and growing as you think about the next you know, generation of kids they serve. Um, and our BEAT program is guaranteed that, you know, students have at least one teacher of color, which we know that research shows makes a profound difference for kids. Um, and it not only gets teachers into the classroom, but it enables them to stay. Our, we're finding that these participants are retained in the classroom at higher levels. At the end of three years, they're outpacing national um, rates of turnover for teachers of color. And so we're able to hang on to them a little bit longer. We've been asking ourselves, trying to look and study, like, why? Why are they staying longer? Some of the things you can see uh, as a part of the preparation, we provide them with a really realistic view of the, of the classroom teacher. I mean, you know, by the time they've completed pre-service, there are not going to be a lot of surprises regarding the realities of what our students and families face. Um, some people might think it's crazy, but we load up their pre-service plates, right? They're, they are intentionally full with lesson prep, with student relationship management, and with teaching practice, not to mention the stress of balancing it all on a loan, lean stipend and a, and, a, and a starter salary, because unfortunately we're gonna ask that of them all year long in this profession, right? And so I, I think they go in equipped, but then we've created this village of peers, right? They've got a cohort of coaches and mentors they can lean on and the encouragement and belief that they're in the right place doing work they were meant to do. Um, and, and building that collective environment, we have found, we, we, we think is really, really key to retaining folks and, and helping them both to not only be successful, but to thrive and support others. You know, at the same time, we, we run a program called The Village. We've been bringing together school leaders and superintendents of color through a program that creates space for them to convene and support one another so that they can continue to create community and lead even when times are as challenging are, as they are today. And so, um, you know, I, I can, I'm, I'm, Jean is going to speak much more to like leaders play a huge role in creating these inclusive school cultures that impact teacher retention, particularly for teachers of color. Instability at the leadership level just compounds retention problems among frontline educators. So it's absolutely, you know, essential that uh, the retention and recruitment of high quality school and district leaders is part of this conversation, not just teachers um, in the classroom, but a priority for policymakers. And ultimately, you know, seeking a better workforce design strategy. You know, the the whether it's licensure barriers, Carnegie, everything that drives us to be trapped in this 180 day you know, seven hour box that we've been living in has got to be reexamined if we really want to um, create a value proposition as to why people both want to come, but really want to stay. Um, I was going to, I was, I was going to leap, kind of leap into the importance of like teacher leadership as a retention strategy, but we'd been chatting the other day, Dr. Moss, you had mentioned some specific research to that. And I wonder if you could, if I could like pass it to you to kind of dig in on as, a, as I'm getting at like role recreation and workforce redesign. I mean, I think that's a really key lever that we ought to talk about. Thank you, Victoria. I appreciate you uh, naming this as workforce redesign strategies um, because that's exactly what it is. Um, we still work on an agrarian calendar. Um, our school design is very much so designed for, uh, it's designed for folks um, who, who are working class, and, and we, we just have a, a lot to do in terms of redesigning our system. And that's actually what led me to some of the research um, that I was doing. And I think about my own story as a classroom teacher. I often say, had there been opportunities for me to lead while teaching and take on some of these opportunities for leadership, then I might still be in the classroom today. Mm. I, I, I've given that song a couple of times and, and no one seems to want to dance to it. 
Um, but the research is clear. So Educators for Excellence puts out a Voices from the Classroom survey um, every year. And I took on studying that survey since 2018. And there are four questions in that survey that are, are very specific to teacher leadership, three of which um, are focused on modalities or redesigning, so to speak, the workday so teachers can feel successful. The fourth question embedded in there is around pressure to become an administrator in order to advance in their career. And in the, the first three questions, one is really grounded in teachers saying, I wish I had more opportunities um, as a teacher to further my career and my professional skills while in the classroom. The third one is really around having an opportunity to impact education policy. The fourth one is really unique and it's around having a hybrid role, which is what we call teacher leadership. And mm -hmm. what we hear um, in those three questions alone, uh, just from a demographics perspective, over 95% of teachers say they would like something like that. And that data is consistent from year to year. And where I drill down a good bit is that we, we could not find a strong relationship between how non-white, uh, particularly teachers of color in this situation and white teachers fare here, we couldn't find a relationship. What we did find though, is that there's more desire among teachers of color for these opportunities. And so for me, that signals that if we're gonna build any type of retention strategy, it's gotta involve a hybrid role. It's gotta involve, involve a role where um, teachers of color have some opportunity to impact education policy because they say they want to further their skills while remaining inside of the classroom. And so that was my dissertation work um, and, and came to that understanding. And, and that survey tells us that year after year, that's what classroom teachers want. And so, so I hope that kind of helps the case that you're trying to make here around investments in teacher leadership. And we see some states are doing this with their licensure structure in terms of career advancement continuums. They're putting teacher leadership license in place. One of the challenges is implementation. And I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna talk about that more is what it actually looks like at the school level. So teachers are getting those credentials to be teacher leaders, but it's not being implemented well at the systems level. Uh, I'm I'm eager to get to both Amanda and Jean on this one because you know unfortunately only about nine percent of teachers and nine percent of principals in public schools right now are Latino while Latino students represent twenty eight percent of K twelve school students and I believe Latinos for Education was sort of founded for this exact point um, to be the first Latino founded and led or organization dedicated to creating those pathways for, for uh, Latinos in education. So Amanda, I would love if you could talk a little bit more about the work that you all are leading, um, both locally um, and nationally at Latinos for Education. And I know it's broad, it's policy, it's advocacy, it's practice, um, but you know those strategies that you all are, are, are implementing to, to, de to develop those pathways for, for Latino educators. Um, so we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, TNTP, for having us on with you today, and great to see our fellow panelists. Um, the wealth of knowledge here is um, always something inspiring to me, and there's so much that's possible when we can focus on the systems level change that uh, you were speaking about, Victoria. So uh, you heard Manny Cruz, my colleague, talk a little bit about who Latinos for Education is. I'm the CEO and founder. I founded Latinos for Education seven years ago with this idea that we needed to both increase the representation of educators at all levels in education uh, because of the, the rising demographic of Latino students, as you mentioned, Andy. And at the same time, we needed to work on policy and advocacy and ensure that the voices of those who are part of our communities are uplifted to remove barriers and obstacles that get in the way of Latino children um, accessing both the, the educators they need, but also just the general education that they should have access to in our country. So with that, um, the last couple of years here in Massachusetts, and then most recently uh, in the last year, uh, we both developed the Educator Diversity Act in Massachusetts, led by my colleagues, Manny Cruz and Victoria Torres, um, who've done an amazing job here in Massachusetts. And then we've also launched the Latino Action Agenda. That's a national agenda that looks at policies broadly across early childhood, 
uh, K-12 and higher ed that we support to remove barriers, both to representation, but also general access. I'm gonna to focus today on the Educator Diversity Act and share a little bit about what went into that and how, how it's going. Uh, so, so we determined that we needed to really, again, leverage one of our values of bridging across cultures. And we identified early on that there were over 50 plus organizations in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that worked at some part of the educator pipeline, whether it was recruitment or working in higher ed institutions to prepare educators, organizations like ours that focus on accelerating leadership and retaining educators, et cetera. Over 50, and I don't think we even reached all of those. Um, but what that told us was that we had a very fragmented system that was looking at how do we actually affect systems change. And, and so what we did was to bring together this group of people to start talking about how do we more formalize a, a way in which we're working together to both affect practice change, but prioritizing policy change, which would be essential. We can't do the practice change without the policy change and vice versa. So we focused on making sure that the voices of this, what would emerge as a large coalition of diverse organizations, higher ed institutions, to really be the driving force in developing what would be and what would become the Educator Diversity Act. The Educator Diversity Act um, was introduced to the legislature a session ago. We're in the second session where this bill is still in action. What we did was to work with this coalition to identify the priorities, what would be the essential components of this bill that we would ask legislators to adopt. And how it relates to our topic of conversation today is we looked at several provisions, again, driven by this group. It was not easy to do with a large group to get to a set of priorities that would become provisions of the Educator Diversity Act. So really quickly, um, collecting data, we don't have enough accurate data on what the actual diversity of our educators even look like um, to even think about the more targeted interventions to retain educators of color. So it's a very basic piece that even at the federal level, we need to do a better job of getting the data to get accurate on, on our pool, who are we even talking about? Um, then a, a couple of other provisions, school districts and schools creating mechanisms and processes to directly hear from teachers of color. The Educator Diversity Act um, ensures that there would be advisory councils um, to school committees, to district leaders on issues of DE&I in local school districts. We have to have those who are most affected by this issue at the table having the conversations and asking for what they need. School districts must uh, invest in PD, which we've already heard and that must be part of the conversation, making sure that things like uh, the fellowships that we offer, that the work that New Leaders does, that TNTP does is part of the fabric of what our districts are uh, incorporating uh, because we, ha we have the expertise, we can bring it in. And it obviously has to be part of the budgeting process. We keep talking about financial cliffs coming up with the end of the ESSA dollars. We need to be um, ensuring that talent is first and foremost um, what we what we hold close and that we continue to invest in, and in particular educators of color. So these are a few of the, of the components. I will also offer that we created a roadmap um, that I th I'm hoping we can put in the chat that, that really outlines what was the process that we have taken on in building the coalition, creating a bill, getting legislative support for it, the continued advocacy and organizing that is necessary, um, budgetary, uh, aspects that we want to incorporate to ensure that there's both policy, but also dollars that are aligned and assigned to being able to retain educators of color. So that is still a work in progress. We've been able to get um, huge amounts of support by the education co-chairs of the Massachusetts legislature, as well as many other legislators. We're in our second um, phase in continuing to work hard to get the bill through the finish line. 
And I'm hoping to report out favorably in the coming months and year that that bill has gotten done. And so we hope you'll have the same session a year from now and we have good news to report. But this is the work, you all. We got it. We the, the key, and I'm going to end here because I know Jean needs to take the mic here, but it's it's consistent, continued effort. It, it can't end. It's got to be relentless with our legislators Educator diversity has to stay at the forefront of their minds. We've got to always be in front of them. We've got to train our educators to be talking with our educate uh, our legislators and getting in front of them. They are the credible people. So there's a lot that goes into it that I'm again, I'm going to point to the roadmap for you all if you're interested in taking on this work at a state level and getting a bill done. At that um, or with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jean for the final words here on, on this current topic. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. It's great to be with, with all of you. Uh, <clears throat> what I actually wanna do is build off of a few points that's been raised, uh, particularly the point raised by my friend, Victoria, around the important role of school leadership. And a question that I think all of us want to answer is why is school leadership so important to this conversation around teacher retention? In 2012, the Gates Foundation, in partnership with Scholastic, launched a major survey where they surveyed over 30,000 teachers, wanting to know what are the factors that excite and keeps you in the role? over 97% of those teachers said the number one factor that drives their retention is the quality of their principal. And when you take a step back, in many ways it's common sense, right? Because the person you work for, the person who creates the culture, sets the vision, creates the work environment, drives your ability and your willingness to stay in the role. That is in every industry, every sector. Education, schools are no different. So uh, at New Leaders, what we have done for the past 20 years is focus on the recruitment, development, support in order to drive retention of the next generation of school leaders. We've developed over 8,000 leaders impacting 2 million students. Over a thousand of those leaders are school leaders, and the majority of whom, over 70%, are leaders of color who have gotten strong student achievement gains, higher percentage of their teachers staying in the role, and the piece that we're pleased with, over 80% of them stay in their roles five years or later. So as we think about what the opportunities are, it's clear based on some of the points Amanda, Victoria, Dr. Moss have raised that there are clearly examples that we can harness and leverage. Uh, question is how do we do it with a level of intentionality in order to be able to do it at scale? Andy, I know you also have another question for me, so I wanna turn it over to you. Uh, to, ask, to, to ask the question so we can continue the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the school leadership piece is so important. And so what, what practices have you seen um, district and state leaders implement that have real results on the retention of school leaders of color? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as part of that, it, it'd be really interesting to also to hear more about why new leaders in particular is partnering with HBCUs in so much of your work? Yeah, it's a, I'm happy you asked that question. And we all both talk about what we have seen and also talk about why we're partnering with HBCUs. I'll start by sharing work that we have done in partnership with three preeminent HBCUs. So we partnered with Morehouse College, Spelman, and Clark Atlanta University. Uh, to do a research, a research paper that we titled 
the shoulder tap to look at what are the key elements around recruitment and retention of teachers and leaders of color. And, and as part of the study, what we did, we had a conversations with thousands of, of teachers across the country. And uh, we looked at a number of districts and states who are doing some promising work in this area. And there were two things, there were two, two themes that were consistent across the board. Victoria actually touched on a couple of them. One was around mentorship. Yeah, wherever possible, how do you ensure that you are providing mentorship opportunities uh, to, in particular, wherever possible, same, same race, supervisors, veteran leaders of color, uh, because we know how important that role model piece is. Second, creating affinity groups and communities of practice where leaders of color can problem solve, share resources, and I would say most importantly, find like a safe space of support. Because what we know is that while this is unfortunate, we have seen enough data to show that leaders of color are often not afforded the same grace as their peers. And just given that reality, particularly in their first year, being given that space and that level of support to, to be able to make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, grow in a way without feeling that their jobs will be in jeopardy or that they could get removed from a role is critically important. Now, based on all of those factors and the fact that we all alluded to this point, Victoria started by saying she's been doing this work for over 20 years, and we've still not moved the needle in any meaningful way. It became clear to us at New Leaders that there was such an opportunity to try to move the needle. So three years ago, we formed a partnership with Morehouse College and Clark Atlanta University with the goal of being the largest provider of equity focused leaders, particularly leaders of color in the country. And through that partnership, we are providing certifications and masters through an online program. And what makes the program unique is the level of inten intentionality that Amanda alluded to around how we're thinking about recruiting leaders, developing them, and ensuring that they have a national body of ongoing support that they can lean on. So to date, over 90% of all of the leaders who've applied and gotten into the program are leaders of color. And just given that fact that we are cautiously optimistic that not only will we move the needle around diversification and representation, but that we will have far greater retention than we've seen in the past. That's fantastic, Gene. That's really fantastic. And, and, and you know, I think um, given some recent national developments, I, I think that conversation about how we are partnering and investing in um, institutions of higher ed in particular that are already diverse by design is going to be um, one that we should be paying attention to and, and, and really thinking about. So I appreciate um, you all sort of being on the frontier of some of that work um, before, before we had to. Um, Dr. Moss, you, you wear a lot of hats. Um, you've been a classroom teacher, a school leader, district leader, um, policy advisor for a member of Congress, professor, a fellow at the NAACP. Um, and in all of those roles, um, supporting and retaining educators of color has been a focus for you. Um, I'm just curious, like what brought you to topic, what brought you to focus on this topic in the in the first place? Um, and then what are some of the innovative strategies that that you've seen in your work um, that could really help to retain 
um, teachers and leaders of color because I, I, you you studied it from so many vantage points. And so curious, um, what what's striking you as innovative and promising right now? Yeah, thank you, Andy, um, for, for letting me weigh in in this way. You know, when I started on this educator diversity journey, I started as a doc student um, and I was working with CCSSO at the Department of Ed and we built an entire plan for Mississippi to diversify its educator workforce. And I actually learned that we probably have one of the more diverse educator workforces in the country. Uh, I, I believe at the time we were the least diverse in my mind, but the data actually pointed in a, in a very different direction. But I ran across this Tennessee study and the Tennessee study was about the long-term uh, impact uh, of same race teachers um, in math and reading and in, in terms of student achievement. Mm. And for me, the most interesting data in that study was that at the time, 96% of the students were white that were represented in the study. But what was found in the study was that there was 8.9, uh, right? Looking at it in terms of percentage points, right? Over four years of an impact on, on math and reading scores, right? When a white student had a white teacher for four consecutive years, it woefully shifted the accepted wisdom about how that white student could perform. And so for me, I was imagining, what if that reality was true for students of color? If students of color could have a black teacher for four consecutive years, might we see the same academic gains? And then I started dismantling why we could not have that reality in place and started to consider it from a policy perspective, a research perspective and a practice perspective. And what I came to terms with is that you're right, leadership um, that my colleagues have so eloquently spoken about, um, if, you know, in terms of even hiring Black teachers, what we find in Black and Brown teachers is that if you don't have a Black and, a black and Brown school leader, the likelihood of hiring a Black and Brown teacher is, is insane. Um, so um, we, we saw that. And I more recently got into compensation work, Andy, and understanding teacher compensation, which Amanda joined us on Capitol Hill to file a bill um, to raise the minimum salary across the country with teacher compensation. So that was one of the pieces. And then finally, uh, it's this climate piece that even when we recruit black and brown teachers to spaces uh, and other teachers of color, there's a, there's a great deal of hostility with regard to their teaching practices that they're often met with. And so how do we dismantle the way in which whiteness has done its work on us through educator preparation that argues that the way in which these teachers of color um, teach and deliver content is not aligned to rubrics or not aligned to Danielson and all of those great and wonderful white folks uh, who have defined teaching for so long. So those are things that we, we've had to disrupt. And you ask me across the country, what are some levers that have been pulled um, and Jean mentioned this earlier, but in Ohio, one of the things they put together is a model called mentoring for diversity. And what they have developed is a model of training mentors for teachers of color. They did this with the Region 8 Comprehensive Center and the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders at AIR. They built an entire model for what does it actually look like to train folks who are same race to mentor other educators who are same race. We, we certainly won't sit here and note that we've all had the same lived experiences. And so there's, there's power, power in understanding that. But there's also an element of how do you train folks who are white? When an educator workforce is 70% white, often you can't match another teacher of color with a mentor who identifies in the same race of them. And so how do we train folks in that way? Um, and, and I found that to be promising. I think the other part that I wanna just flag in this call is, you know, in the Obama administration passed God authorizing language and law for the Augustus Hawkins Centers of Excellence for, um, uh, you know, for universities, particularly HBCUs and HSIs, to be able to expand the pipeline. And one of the one of the tensions out there is like that money is for recruitment right now. How do we expand that pot? That it be also about retention to be able to work with HSIs and HBCUs to be able to do this. So I think there's an opportunity. We just got that program funded again 
Um, but that is one lever. And the final lever that, um, that those are two levers I shared that I think that, that are possible. The third and final one is uh, there's a, you know, you got school districts who are investing in residency programs and 80 to 90% of teacher residency programs across the country. And we started one in Mississippi when I was at the Department of Ed attract diverse candidates in the pipeline. We, we've got Latino, Latina candidates, Black candidates um, who are onboarding into the teacher profession through teacher residency programs. And districts are beginning to build them themselves and circumvent traditional educator preparation program. Now, as a person who sits in a traditional program, I'm not asking that we go out and do that. I think we can do it in concert, but that is what I've seen across the country. But fundamentally, we've got to go back to my second point on my way out of this conversation is we've got to do something about compensation. Um, you know, I, I think about what I said in an article with ABC News this week. You know, you asked me to make $32,000 my first year teaching and you asked me to take care of family, whatever family means for, for those of us are on this call. You, you can't raise a dog. I have a dog named Elijah. You can't raise Elijah and myself on $32,000. So we've got to do something in this country with regard to diversity uh, of the educator profession and, and, and linking that to compensation. But I'm rambling here. So I, I think I've answered all of your questions. So I'll pause. I appreciate you, Dr. Moss. Um, so as we begin to wrap up before we go into audience Q&A, um, I'll give you all one of two options, either some, some final words of your own choice, or um, you know, we really want the audience to leave with some concrete takeaways. Um, so the question I have is, you know, we we do this and it works really well. Um, we do this and it works really well. What's that? What's that for you? Victoria, we can start with you. Um, I, I think we've all, I think Jean in particular, both through your programs and ours, like we know that you can create community and right. that network of support works really well. You cannot underestimate it, right? Um, so that is a, a very, you know, tactical, implementable thing you can do, you know, whether it's through mentorships or just networking, create community. Um, I think, you know, behaviorally, what does that mean? Always asking yourself, who's not at this table and why? in terms of who has the permission to create, you know, community, who's who's driving the creation of community. So just having that lens open to like, why aren't these things happening? And what would it take to make sure they happen? I think that's one um, that just jumps to mind. Yeah. Gene, we can go to you next. Sure, sure. Uh, really like what for me is building community. Um, it's also important to recognize sometimes when you're having these conversations around representation and diversity, it's important to recognize what may be the elephant in the room. And for me, and what I have often heard is that some may view these conversations as is the goal to replace white leaders. And it is really important to point out that the conversations we're having is not about replacement here. It's actually about a growth strategy. We have amazing human capital that is being underutilized. And that is happening because we're not being strategic and intentional. And I think that's been a recurrent theme. So as I think about your question, Andy, if we do this well, then what? What it means is 20 years from now, hopefully uh, when Victoria, and Dr. Morris and Amanda and I have moved on to do something else, but we, we have a reunion to talk about this, we won't be in the same position that we've been in the past 20 years, that we can see meaningful improvement in this shameful representation gap that's existed all too long. Thanks, Jane. Dr. Moss? Yeah, you know, when, when I think about, I want to say this a little differently, when I think about what should be different um, as a result of this conversation and future work, um, I think about 
an ecosystem for this work. I think there's there's a lot of patchwork that's actually happening when it comes to like educator diversity. And I'm bringing this together. And this is why I love the 1 million teachers of color campaign, uh, because I think you all are building this ecosystem for us to bring everyone to the table to begin to think about in 15 years, what does this look like from a policy perspective, a practice perspective, and a research perspective? And I'm gonna hang my hat on the evidence perspective. We were working with a group of folks, they brought me in to, to help them think about a federal grant they were applying for to be able to do educator diversity work. And you actually can't access a lot of federal grants to do educator diversity work because the evidence thresh, the evidence bar is not there, right? We've cited the same evidence over and over again. And so I think to wrap this up, what I wanna see more is more evidence created around this. Um, a group of us just submitted um, for a study to be funded by Spencer to add to the evidence base because there's not enough evidence around this work to be able to receive the large federal dollars we want. So I'd like to see over the next few years, we lean in in that way. And I think the ecosystem you all are building with the 1 million teachers of color campaign can serve that space as well. Not just policy, not just practice, but evidence and research. Really great. And, and, and to wrap us up before going into audience Q&A, um, Amanda. Thank you. So I'm going to say two things. One at the at the very um, at the very individual level, and then at the systems level. So I'm going to double down on Victoria and Jean on this important piece that actually isn't that hard to do, which is creating that connection and opportunities for connection with the hundreds of Latino leaders who have gone through our fellowships, our aspiring Latino leadership fellowship, our Latinx teacher fellowship. Every single time, the number one, the number one benefit of our programs are to establish that connection and that network and to feel like I have a space where I belong and I have others where I can be myself. That goes a really long way to retaining our educators. And it can be done in many different ways, as we already heard. So I just say to our friends out there who are listening right now, this is a really important lever that can be done pretty easily, but not always successfully. So always making sure that you have the right people who are figuring out how to provide that in your school, in your school district, et cetera. The other piece, I'm going to go back to the system-wide change on the policy side. Uh, we've got to combine both the policy and the practice change and think about um, all of the different levers that need to be pulled from a policy perspective across the continuum. You might not be able to do it all at once, but we got to build toward um, removing the barriers across different um, parts of our policy landscape. So again, I'm going to point to um, come see us at latinosforeducation.org to learn more about the Educator Diversity Act and what we've done to build that out and to learn about how we've gone about our policy work there and also the white paper that was put in the chat. So there are things we can do and we've got to, again, continue to keep the momentum going and the commitment going within our states and at the federal level. And again, thanks to One Million Teachers for coming together and looking at this work at a nationwide level, we can do this. And I think we're all ready to get to that next level that we need to be at. All right, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, so now we're gonna turn to questions from the audience. We'll have um, about 10 minutes um, for this section. So if you haven't submitted a question via the Q&A function, um, please do so now. Um, a few have already been coming in. Jean, the first one's for you. You mentioned the partnership between um, Morehouse and CAU, um, and you mentioned being cautiously optimistic about the outcome comes from the partnership. And the question is, why are you cautiously um, op optimistic about, about the outcomes from the partnership? <laughs> well, yeah, I'll take out cautiously because I will say, uh, just to give you a sense of just the level of interest and excitement, the pilot, we had 25 uh, people enrolled. In August, we have our next cohort where we're anticipated anywhere from 150 to 200 people from across the country. Um, again, large majority uh, leaders of color. And this point that we keep emphasizing, this notion of philosophically aligned, 
community that's being created has been one of the biggest pieces that's just been underscored continuously. Uh, and the fact that Morehouse and Crockett and Answer have both been willing partners gives us confidence and hope. And when I talked about being cautiously optimistic, in our mind, we think there's a tremendous opportunity to identify a couple of more HBCUs and MSIs to really take this to scale across the country. Thanks, Jane. Um, Dr. Moss, this one's for you. So, um, you know, we often start these conversations by saying that there's a ton of research and evidence uh, that demonstrates the positive impact that students of color, that teachers of color have on all students, but especially students of color. Um, but you just mentioned that there's evidence missing. Uh, so this question asks, can you share more about um, the evidence that, that you feel is lacking? Yeah, and I really appreciate this question in that um, it's really the way in which we've cut this nation has come to terms with evidence. And so I want to name that the evidence actually is there. It's the way in which ESSA and the like, it has these four tiers, right? Strong, moderate, promising, and rationale. And most of them, they're most of the time they're looking for statistically controlled or correlational studies, or they're looking for quasi-experimental studies, right? Or um, just experimental studies in general is, is what is really being looked for to be able to use federal government funding to be able to sort the, support these programs. I think we need to look at evidence in a different way, and we need to understand that lived experience is a data point, um, and all of these things are important in our work. But right now, the way in which funding is actually given is based on these four tiers that the federal government has defined. So the evidence is actually out there. But the evidence that we have doesn't always fit into these four tiers that the federal government has laid out. And so how do we, one, continue to push back on that, but two, begin to produce evidence within these tiers? And so we're looking for statistically controlled or correlational studies that would meet that evidence bar. We can generate more of those, but at the same time, we should be pushing back on these definitions of evidence. And so um, I really appreciate the posture of the question because I think it's twofold. Yes, we wanna start meeting some of these tiers um, that have been laid out in ESSA, but we also wanna push back on some of these notions and say the lived experiences alone of, of educators of color um, is enough and should be enough evidence, whether we're controlling that, whether it's part of a quasi-experimental study or not, it's relevant, it's necessary, and it should be funded just off that alone. But the research field is not there yet. Um, and so I, I just wanna honor that reality and push back on, the, on that truth too. Andy, may, may I quickly yes. jump in? Because I was quickly scrolling through some of the Q&A, and there were a couple of references to this that I just think is so important for us to quickly address. We are all talking about the importance of representation, because what we know, as Dr. Morse pointed out, and as we've raised, is the, the correlation between greater representation and actually greater student achievement outcomes, not only for white kids, but particularly for students of color. We're saying representation is absolutely necessary and critical, and it's not sufficient. Right? The goal here is to ensure we're driving greater outcomes for kids, particularly low-income kids of color. And the evidence, the research, the data has shown you achieve that in part by having far greater representation than we currently have. So I, I've noticed in a couple of questions, people were asking whether or not uh, leaders, and student, leaders and teachers of color lead to greater student achievement outcome. And the data has been incredibly clear on that. The research has been clear that the answer is absolutely yes. Thank you. Um, a question for, for, for anyone here. Um, I'm gonna do some summarizing uh, of this one because it's longer. One big challenge for black teachers can be that in majority white um, staff uh, schools, there are microaggressions and other challenging school experiences. Um, along with affinity groups to provide a safe space, have you seen any schools or districts that have instituted any kind of restorative justice systems? to make a space where these teachers can receive an apology and engage in restorative conversation. 
So I think I, I think this question, if I'm if I'm summarizing even, even more, have you seen um, schools or districts institute more of a restorative justice space? Um, that's kind of cross identity and, you know, for the sake of repairing damage or harm, um, as opposed to just the affinity space. Go ahead, Victoria. I can jump in, Andy. This is, um, we've been doing some work across the state of New Mexico with First Nation peoples and in, in indigenous communities. And you often have the case where it, it is a white staff teaching indigenous um, students. And we've done a lot of work with those communities to come up with um, approaches that they felt would create both that space to have that conversation, both the space to do some restorative practice, but also um, to continue that conversation, to just reshape narratives, to relearn things that have to be unlearned and learned. Um, and they've put strategies in place. They have, they call them community navigators now. And there are people from the community in buildings helping to like, um, you know, I, I hesitate because sometimes it puts the burden on the people of color to do that education, but they are community net navigators who want to be in the space, who have come in and are leading an ongoing education process of everything from how this curriculum is impacting our kids to, you know, daily hallway experiences and yes, teacher to teacher um, interactions. And so it's been, um, like a three-year process to be in community, to draw in community voice, to get a seat at the table, and then to co-create like what that would look like. But that's that's a space where um, that work has led to really nitty-gritty. Now, now it's moved into like HR talent strategy. That was never the original intent, right? They, it, it, it's This work started as a curriculum project around the states rolling out high-quality materials. What is this going to mean in this community? And it became this much larger conversation and now is going from the, the big conversation into the strands of all of our work and how they're, it's all related. And, um, and so that's one thing that just jumped into my mind I wanted to share. I'm going to end with um, a, a call to action that I, that I see in the chat, which is what can we do um, and what work is currently being done collectively to advocate for higher teacher pay? Well, you can uh, you can start trying to convince the members of Congress that they have a federal obligation um, to support states uh, with teacher pay. Um, I, I think that that is one direction. There seems to be a growing appetite. Um, just learned this morning of more conversations around a federal intervention with teacher salaries. And so whatever way you can push in that regard. And Andy, I just want to say earlier when I went across the four tiers of evidence, I want to make sure I clear this up publicly, is that I was talking about evidence to actually make a teacher diversity um, intervention uh, be a, a recognized intervention to, to get funding for, right? So I didn't say that in the beginning. So any of these retention strategies that we're talking about that are squarely focused on educators of color, in order for them to become a recognized intervention, they have to meet one of the four, uh, preferably tier one, which says we have strong evidence and this can be replicated time and time again. So I just wanted to, to, to clarify that point too. The just rel track, yes. <laughs> relative to teacher pay, I just will point to the American Teacher Act, which was introduced um, by Representative uh, Jamal Bowman out of New York and Frederica Wilson out of Florida. And so there is, you know, uh, there is federal legislation that's been introduced. Um, so I think it's just something, if you haven't heard of it, to take a look at what that is. And it does talk about what the minimum salary requirements should be um, and other, again, other provisions that can be looked at. So I would, I would look at that. Latinos for Education has stood behind the American Teacher Act. So um, even the what might you might think is a small act of signing on to something like this is actually important to raising awareness of a bill like this um, that we need to support. So I would put that out there to you all. Thanks, Amanda. And, and we're at time and it, it, it makes me think that we also, you know, should continue the conversation, not just around 
teacher compensation, but really rethinking the whole financial value proposition of teaching um, from pre-service through, you know, in-service. Um, but certainly um, compensation is a big component of that. Uh, my colleague, Nithia Joseph, just posted a survey. So one minute, it shouldn't take more than one minute um, for you to fill out, which will help us develop the campaign's future webinars um, and ensure we're targeting the needs of all those who want to be a part of this, this collective effort with us. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, we're at time, especially thank you to um, our esteemed panelists, Jean, Victoria, Amanda, and Dr. Moss. Um, and a huge thank you to the team at Latinos for Education for co-hosting today's webinar in partnership um, with TNTP um, under the One Million Teachers of Color campaign banner. Um, thank you all for a great conversation. And with that, we're going to close out and look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar. Thank you.